race conditions are the bane of a programmer's existence. This video is going to talk about some techniques for how to prevent them. If you need a review on what a race condition is, check out the link above. Because they require the interaction between two threads, race conditions are really hard to reproduce and thus really hard to debug. Careful planning when you're coding can help prevent them. In this video, I'll show you how Java's synchronized keyword lets you control access to a block of code across threads. In the next video, I'll talk about how Java provides binary and counting semaphores. Java gives us the synchronized keyword to state that a block of code can only be entered by one thread at a time. For example, since this code is updating an instance variable, it has the potential for a race condition if two different threads try to update the same object. By marking the method as synchronized, we're stating that we only want to let one thread into that method at a time. One can enter, but then everyone else trying to call the method on the same object is blocked out until the first one exits that method. One thing that we worry about when we start blocking people out of code is called liveness. It's a measure of how many threads are running. The more we block threads, the lower our liveness will be. Putting a simple arithmetic operation inside a synchronized block isn't a big hit to liveness. However, we'd prefer not to put expensive operations inside synchronized blocks. Suppose that we wanted to print out the value that x has become. Printing even just to the screen takes a relatively long time, so I'd rather not have that inside the synchronized block. The good news is that we can synchronize for just a block of code instead of for the whole method. However, that still has a race condition. If the task got interrupted after it left the synchronized block, but before it called print line, somebody else could get into the block and modify x. We need to be even more careful. By storing x into a local variable, that will be on the current thread's call stack, so we get our own copy of the value we want to print. Then we can let go of the synchronization and not worry, because we'll print out the value that we made x become. Now we can explicitly see that we're locking a particular object. In other words, the state of blocking is stored in that object. In this case, we're blocking on the object this that owns the instance variable that we're worried about. Only threads that synchronize on the same object will be blocked. Well, that works perfectly in this case because the shared variable is owned by the this object. When you synchronize a method, it defaults to synchronizing on the current object, this. Suppose x was static, like static x here, and two different shared class objects were updating it. Clearly, if we don't do anything, and objects from different threads called add to static race, we'd have a race condition. Interestingly, synchronizing on the this object, either in the method definition or around just a block of code we're worried about, also has the race condition. Each object would synchronize on itself, so they wouldn't keep each other out. The way to fix this is use the fact that we can lock on any object. So I can create a separate, separate object to act as the lock. Here, I created an object whose sole purpose was to be the lock protecting static x. I made the lock static because I want every object to use the class level lock since it's protecting a class level object. It's best practice to mark the locked object as final so that no one will make it the variable reference a different object as that would move the lock to a different object and break our locked areas. Now that we know about locking on different objects, we can use that to improve liveness, making sure that we can block only people who are playing with the variable that we're playing with. In this example, Lock 1 is protecting C1, and Lock 2 is protecting C2. If we're only updating one of those variables, we only need to synchronize on its lock. That improves liveness because one thread can be in Inc1, while another is in Inc2. However, if we need to change both, we have to nest the locks to be sure that we get them both. If we start to nest locks like this, you need to learn about the dining philosopher's problem and make a consistent ordering to how you synchronize the lopped objects. 
I'm going to leave that to another video.